Thank you very much to all of you for joining us at this very debating chamber, the debating society that has produced six prime ministers uh, in the past in British history. And on this very special occasion this year, where it's the third centenary of the creation of the prime minister's office, to talk about this topic, the impossible office, which we've cleverly stolen from uh, Sir Anthony's book title, uh, I would like to invite all of you to give us an opening remark on what have you think the role of prime minister and his office has evolved and changed over the years. Sir Anthony. It's very nice to be, to be here. And look, this is such an amazing uh, time, isn't it? 300 years since the creation of this office, the longest lasting office, leader's office anywhere in the world, and the office that has arguably had greater influence on the history of the world than any other single office from a building at Downing Street, first occupied in 1735, that has had a longer continuous influence than any building anywhere in the world. This is the building in whose rooms history has been made uh, and so copied by so many other countries around the world, uh, the Office of Prime Minister. So let's just think about uh, the Prime Minister. Uh, well, what can we say? We can talk about Eton, uh, can't we? Uh, uh, and after Eton, a fairly murky uh, ascent, uh, reputation for being a bit of a chancer, womanizer, uh, larger than life uh, figure who was going any which way, very open to influence by all number of uh, people, very interested in the media uh, and in influencing the media. And then career appeared to be going absolutely nowhere until a extraordinary event uh, hitting the country out of a blue uh, sky and suddenly wham, bang, there uh, he is, uh, this Etonian in number 10 Downing Street uh, with somebody by his side, a woman 25 years his junior who uh, he has not yet married and he almost dies, amazingly, well, what about this? Almost died in the first year in office, uh, severely uh, affected by uh, an epidemic, uh, affecting much of what he did and by a threat uh, from Scotland, a chancer, a larger than life figure, and that of course is Robert Walpole. Uh, and in a way, the, uh, the, the, the funny, unusual thing about the Prime Minister is how much has changed and how little has changed from the number one to the number 55 Prime Minister, uh, 53 men, two women. Uh, and, and just in the little time that I've been given uh, to talk, let me just say that, you know, what can we do to bring together and say, why have so few of them actually made an enduring difference? I mean, that's what strikes me, having uh, studied these people for so long, how few of them, not how many, have made the weather, made history, affected the course and direction of this country. Only nine uh, have done that. And if there are five rules for a successful premiership, uh, and you can uh, want to, uh, you welcome to see how far this applies to the current Chancellor, uh, an Etonian in number 10 now. First is, if it's a really difficult job, impossible office. That's a great title, you know, for a talk. Uh, you, know, if, well, why, you know, if it's so difficult, why do they want to do it, we could ask. At least follow the advice, bring in great talent. Bring in the brightest and the best, not just into your team uh, in cabinet and running ministries, but running the great affairs of state. And in number 10, bring in the people who really know how to do it. Don't trash your uh, predecessor. Uh, absolutely not. Don't do that. So number one rule, it's only going to work if like, uh, like, well, Clement Attlee, that great Labour government after the war, or Harold Wilson in the 1960s, or Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s, full of giants. Second is you have to change from being a prime minister at the head of your party 
to being a statesman or a stateswoman. You are now uh, overseeing the entire country. You're not just a party political figure, and you must not trash the state or the state's conventions. You are the keeper of the conventions of the state. And if you do go around trashing it and acting as a slight political figure uh, without showing respect and being respectful to others, including other people on other parties as well as in your own party, you very rapidly lose respect without you even realizing it. Number three, do not enter into commitments that you can't get out of. Now, Tony Blair, the Iraq War, a great military prime minister, a Pitt the Younger in the Napoleonic Wars uh, and the Revolutionary Wars, or Lloyd George and Asquith and Lloyd George, or Churchill, that, that they had a sense about what the end game was. Tony Blair going into the Iraq War, March 2003, biggest error of all is not understanding what is the finishing point? What are we trying to do here? What is going to change? What is our best possible option for getting out of it? David Cameron with the referendum on the EU. Do not enter into something unless you are certain you know how to get out of it. Rule number four is look after the backbenchers. You might find them dull. We might find them dull, but don't let them know that you find them dull. Spend time with them. You know, they are doing their best, often, it's easy to be cynical, for their constituents. Make their life, uh, show them that you have respect because you need them. You need them badly because the chips are going to be uh, go down. And finally, stick with the big picture. Do not get involved in minutiae. Keep your head clear. There are other people who are going to do the uh, little stuff. Prime ministers are remembered for one, sometimes two big things. You need to be thinking as a prime minister. Now, those are five things there. Uh, you can very uh, rapidly see that Boris Johnson gets huge sticks. Um, I'm sure you're thinking on all five of those. But those going back over the 55, you can, you can uh, work it out. And I might just have one final point, very quickly. Uh, we, we talk so much about the, the role of personality in successful prime ministers or successful uh, presidents or uh, successful uh, leaders of, of whatever organization it is. In fact, if we look at prime ministers, they, the great prime ministers, those big nine, have all been there at moments of historic change. They've all had very significant majorities. They've all been there for long times to make an impression. And we can ask a legitimate question, which is, are great, uh, do uh, individuals make uh, great premierships or are great premierships made by history? Do they make history or does history make them? Over. Oh, no, that's very good timekeeping. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Sir Anthony. For those who are interested in the title of The Impossible Office, you know, Sir Anthony's book is on sale in all good bookshops. I'm sure you can find them easily it's a, it's, it's a around, around Oxford. <laughs> it's a bargain. Uh, I'm looking, now I'm going to look to Baroness Fall. Baroness Fall is a British political advisor who served as the deputy chief of staff to David Cameron. She's also an author. She's the author to the best-selling book, The Gatekeeper, Life at the Heart of Number 10. Over to you, Baroness Fall. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I, um, I cannot look back over three centuries like Anthony Zeldin, but I thought I'd offer you a bit of a spread of history um, and to shed some light on what it's really like to work at the heart of Number 10, behind the famous door, and more importantly, behind that sort of less well-known but more important door to the PM's den. Power, to me, is a funny thing. It shifts, has many shifting strands which define a premiership. And I want to look at what that power really is. Um, and my thoughts are organized around three broad themes that I've seen over my time there. Um, 
to become prime minister and then to lead, you need to persuade people to follow you in the first place, govern effectively once they do, and then persuade them that they can't do without you. In other words, win again. You can feel someone has power. It's like an aura. It sort of hovers around them. I have two memories of, of David Cameron, my boss, that is most powerful. One was Muskoku, June 2010, just become prime minister. Um, and it all felt very surreal being in the middle of the Canadian wilderness um, with lots of groundhogs as well as um, premiers. And everyone was gathering for the family photo, um, trying to get as near Barack Obama as possible. And I said to um, David Cameron, are, are you nervous? And he was like, why would I be nervous? I'm prime minister, the greatest country in the world, the, big, the fifth biggest economy, the intelligence services, we're all envy of the world. And I've got five years ahead of me. That is power, that moment, a mandate, a fresh mandate, and the world at his feet. Now, it didn't last that long. Fast forward five years, and I'm sitting in the back of a battle, battle bus We've been up all night, and we never had the wind behind us in that election. Um, and David was literally sort of losing power as I looked at him. He was really taking and preparing for the hit, because those moments when you come into an election fall very heavily on the leadership of the party. It's they who have to resign when it goes wrong. It's they who bear the responsibility. If you like, it's a sort of loneliness of power moment. And I couldn't, neither of us could see a path to victory. And as we gathered round the television that night waiting for the exit poll, which are um, uncannily um, um, right on, unlike other exit polls, um, we were absolutely amazed to find that it was called the Tories were going to be the largest party. And then later that night, at three in the morning, as I sat in a very smelly gym in Whitney next to him, um, the results for Nuneaton came through, and he turned around to me and said, we're going to get a majority. And at that moment, I looked at him and thought, he'd morph from a sort of broken man to a king. And that's another thing about power. It's, it's physical. It has a way of making you look larger than life. So I want to just examine where I feel the power of a prime minister comes from. Um, and one, one of the key things, of course, is simply it comes from the people who put you there. And of course, if you don't have a mandate, that re reduces your power from day one. So someone like Gordon Brown, when he took over from Blair, and Theresa May, when she took over from David Cameron. Um, they, they just didn't have their own mandate, and that really showed. But as you come through your time in government, the key issue is, are you going to win again? And then when you come into the election, um, the Aussie uh, um, election campaigner who worked with me over the years said, it all comes down to two questions, or one question. Is it time for change, or can you not afford change? And you're not going to ever win an election unless you can persuade people of one or the other. Um, and of course, we tried change in 2010, and you can't afford change in 2015. So of course, power comes from people. But ultimately, the people have not voted for the prime, to make the prime minister, e.g. the leader of the party. It's the party. And that's when we come to the point that Anthony just made about not letting the MPs know you find them dull, which... Um, I hope this has not been recorded, this bit. But um, the relationship between a British Prime Minister and the MPs is incredibly important, but it is a very odd one. They have the ultimate power to make you Prime Minister and the one to break you. But in between, they're sort of seen or heard. They're sort of voting for them. But voting for them that hates to be taken for granted, as you can imagine. So hovering there is always the sense of a guillotine that they could just come and get you. And that's when the size of the majority, of course, can matter hugely. Too small, and, and, and you're, you're ruled by a cabal. Too big, and you get caucusing on the back benches. We've seen a lot of that under the Boris premiership. Um, so how do you keep these MPs in line? Well, party loyalty, patronage, but most of all, success. Success is what keeps the MPs with you. You've got their back, they've got your back. If you win, they win. Um, but even if it looks like the Prime Minister has all their cards and the MPs have none, that's not actually true because over time, the combination of the fire, disappointed, disenchanted works away on the sentiment of goodwill until the bees swarm looking for a new queen. And it does happen, let me tell you. Um, I just want to briefly look briefly at 
what what the power, what the job of a PM is, at least what I saw when I worked for six years at the centre of number 10, and Ollie was through the link door, as they call it, in the Cabinet Office. To me, you have to multitask to be a good Prime Minister. You have to be able to firefight 24-7, you have to run the show, and you have to drive the agenda forward. Firefighting, what I mean is basically, frankly, shit happens every day in number 10. And with 24-7 media and social media, there's never a day when a crisis is not happening. But at the same time, you have to know where you're heading. You have to have a sense of purpose. You have to know where you're going. And then you need to actually run the country with people like Ollie Robbins. And to, to govern is to decide famous phrase. And the best MPMs are good decision makers. They have the right temperament. They're able to build a circle of trust around them. Not so narrow that they don't ever listen to the outside, but narrow enough so you don't read about every single conversation, every argument in the Sunday Times, which is you, you've seen a lot recently. And that is because they don't trust each other. In the end, you have to be able to shut the door and trust people to have a, an argument about what you should do. In the end, politics always comes down to judgment. Do you have the judgment to make the difficult decisions and the temperament to exercise it? But charisma does matter too, especially now. You might be a brilliant decision maker and you just don't have the personal charisma to leave the country. The one thing I would say um, to repeat Anthony again is most premiers think they're going to be remembered by something and are remembered by something completely different. So Tony Blair, did he ever think of Iraq when he kicked crossed the... No, he didn't. David Cameron in opposition said he didn't want to bang on about Europe. And Boris set himself up to be judged by Brexit and now it's all been COVID. So most prime ministers are throwing curveballs. The best prime ministers are able to capture the mood of the nation in a crisis in a way that really reassures. And if you think about, you know, Blair with the People's Princess um, and, and David Cameron at the beginning with the Bloody Sunday Apology, and, and again, this is not meant to be unkind, but Mrs May, who actually is a very kind woman, was unable to really um, to, to echo the agony and, and awful events um, of Grenfell. So, to summarise... Power comes from the support from the people who gave it to you, the personality to be a national figurehead, the intellect to set and drive the agenda, to make the political weather, the ability to govern, to run the show, the temperament to exercise judgment and be a good decision maker. Ultimately, it's all about, can you take the people with you and you lose power when they stop following you? How the rest of the hour is going to work is I'm going to ask each panelist one question specific to your expertise before I ask more general questions to all the panelists and then I'll open to the floor with some contribution questions from the floor. Um, first, I want to go to Sir Anthony. Sir Anthony, you're well known for uh, your political biographies, chartering the career of prime ministers since Thatcher. Um, one particular thing I want to ask is, the late Howard Macmillan once said about Margaret Thatcher, I do wish you'd pick up a book. So Anthony, do you feel that many of our prime ministers fail through a lack of grip of understanding of history and philosophy? I think that history is uh, really important. Who here is studying history as part of your degree? Okay, I mean, that would include greats, include PPE. So I do think history uh, is overlooked far too much, that many prime ministers come in and they trash their predecessors. So to Boris Johnson, Theresa May was hopelessly, just hopeless. Uh, to Theresa May, uh, David Cameron was far too chummy with, with Etonian uh, upper class uh, friends. Um, and to, 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 to Cameron, Gordon Brown was far too uh, secret, you know, secretive, and, and Gordon Brown wanted to be anything but Tony Blair, and Tony Blair wanted to be anything but John Major, and John Major wanted to be anything than Margaret Thatcher, and back it goes. And, and, you know, that's not a very good or a very respectful way to be thinking, meanwhile, the civil servants are, are, are absolutely uh, caught uh, in, in, uh, in the headlights. Uh, to understand history, to have a reverence 
for history, the history of the office, uh, the history of events. I mean, it's shocking uh, that in many corporate uh, uh, situations, there is more of an understanding about decisions being taken um, uh, and why they've been taken in the past in certain ways than in government, where there is uh, that uh, leader principle uh, that everybody else went wrong because they were foolish or incompetent. Uh, we know what we are doing because we've risen to number 10 without realizing that rising to number 10 uh, and leading your party, this was one of Blair's mistakes, uh, is very different to running the country. It, it is uh, also, um, the, 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 including the current uh, prime minister, um, the, he and his four predecessors, so five altogether, served in just three offices mm -hmm. between them. Mm -hmm. The five before that served in 29 different government departments, and the five before that in 41. That's an extraordinary collapsing of expertise. You would therefore think that there would be an eagerness to try to understand more of uh, the context. And as I was trying to suggest in those uh, five points, there really are things that you can learn about what makes uh, prime ministers different. I totally accept Ollie's point that it is um, uh, very different. Uh, great example about government spending in, in 1914, mm -hmm. uh, before the great rise in socioeconomic spending, etc. cetera. Um, and most of government was local government. It wasn't central government. But so the much changed, but lots of continuities, little respect. Uh, history helps to make us wise. Wise people learn from their own experience. Uh, wise governments learn from experience of previous governments. Thank you, Anthony, for your very candid and honest answer. I'm going to abuse the chair's privilege to ask a cheeky follow-up question, especially you mentioned uh, a lot of prime ministers have had done a lot of rotations among government departments. So does that make Sajid Javid, our current health secretary, a very qualified candidate to take the office? Because <laughs> he, if I remember correctly, uh, six, is the... Uh, six offices. Um, I think he's learned the lesson. I mean, you know, look, he hasn't always been jumping around because of his own wish. I mean, you know, he, he has had people slightly pushing and knocking him around. But I think he's learned the point that if you're going to make an impact, you don't stay in any job unless you're a football manager uh, for, for just a few months. You know, you stay, it takes time to dig in. The successful prime ministers have all been there uh, for six years. Um, all those in that top tier of prime ministers have been there. You need time to make, to make that impact. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anthony. And uh, now to Baroness Fall. Uh, your book, The Gatekeeper, has helped us to uncover some of the day-to-day -day things involved in running the country. Do you feel that in a way, as an unelected senior advisor, you had more influence in many ways than a member of parliament or a minister? And if so, do you think that's good for our uh, parliamentary sovereignty, constitutional democracy? So um, when I was at number 10, I don't think anyone had ever heard of me and the, the person who was the chief staff, Ed Llewellyn. Since I left, I realized that, that we should have been really celebrities and we sort of missed our moment to become famous because all my successes seem to be always in the news and um, household names. So um, I, I think it's probably a good thing that wasn't, but sometimes I do wonder. Um, look, the key thing here is to have a sense of humility. When you work for a prime minister, of course you are at the center of power. If if we agree that the Prime Minister does have power, which they clearly do at some point, but it depends on a variation of things that we've just been looking at. But your power as that member of staff comes only from the Prime Minister. And therefore, in my view, you do, you do need to have a sense of humility about your job. You are not powerful because you've been elected. You're not, you're not going up the career, you're not on the, um, an MP, you haven't been voted and you're not gonna go and become chancellor. So of course you're in the center, in the room when the decisions are made, some of the most important decisions. And so in a way, yes, you are, you do get involved with some of the most important decisions of the day, mm -hmm. but your power is a devolved power. And there have all always been advisors around prime ministers and kings. So in terms of getting in a constitutional tizzy about it, 
it. My view is that that's as old as Britain. <laughs> um, and that I think that but what, what does go wrong is when the advisors become either their own story or take over decision making. And you see that often when the prime ministers themselves just aren't making good decisions themselves. So the answer is, is that yes, in a way, you are at the center of key decisions more so than some certainly some MPs but maybe even some senior cabinet people but in the end you're not powerful on your own self so you're not absolutely say as powerful as Theresa May who is the most senior woman when I was in government. Just very quickly it's common when you have new governments coming in to be suspicious of civil servants because they've worked for five ten years with the other party and they've formed uh, relationships. That also is the case in number 10. Mm -hmm. I was here at Oxford a very long time ago when the Wilson government, actually 74, not 64, I'm not quite that uh, old. There was a lot of suspicion then when Labour came back after uh, the Conservatives, a lot of suspicion when Margaret Thatcher came in that they were all wrong. But it, within time, th 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 they get to realise that the civil servants are very hard work. Look, I'm biased. I, my two daughters work in the civil service. But I think it is uh, a keystone of this country that we have an independent civil service. The interesting point, just very quickly, about this government is that that reserve and suspicion that is quite common with incoming governments uh, has endured. Uh, and I think that is worrying. It's also worrying to see a defence secretary uh, briefing or his special advisors did about getting the top military chiefs in to, to, to tear a strip off them. You, you, you build something up public service and it takes many years to build up traditions of public service and it can be damaged. And honestly, are the quality of governance by the ministers uh, and their own uh, standards so great that they are in a position uh, to... Um, uh, have the attitudes they do about public servants. You know, we, that's where I stand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we're incredibly lucky today. We have this exciting lineup and well balanced lineup of speakers one academic historian, two practitioners in politics. So, on the note of changes of government, I do want to follow up uh, on, a, on a question I think that applies to all three of you, so you can all answer this. Uh, what is the difference? Um, inside number 10 between a coalition government and a conservative only or a labor only government? Um, maybe we'll... All right, I'll jump in first. Um, well, the coalition was radical. It was the first coalition since the war. And it, it was, in a way, an amazing thing in itself. I, I believe, and I still believe, that people were tired of... Um, you know, party politics and always being played out between the two main parties. The, the country was in a difficult moment. The economy was um, in a very bad state. And two parties came together in the national interest. And I, I still believe that was a really refreshing thing. Now, it did cause some issues amongst the actual other, other parties. So the Tory party, for example, the minute... You, the minute we went into coalition with the Lib Dems, of course, lots of people fight Lib Dems in the grassroots, um, and it's quite vicious in fighting. So the idea that you'd suddenly be all chummy in number ten with someone who just said, you know, you, you know, you, you, you know, you ruined my my um, parking permit on the street. I mean, it, it's all like that. They were furious, and then of course you you have a lot of your own MPs who feel very disenfranchised. So a fifth of the jobs in the coalition government, of course, went to the Lib Dems. So that was a fifth people in our party who didn't get jobs they thought they were going to get. That's a lot of angry people to begin with. And by the way, that's also the same bunch of people who didn't vote at all for, for any of the votes in government during the coalition. And then you have just a rather strange thing of cohabiting number 10 with someone from a different family. I mean, I remember the first couple of days, Steve Hilton, who was, who was our sort of guru at the time, he decided he was going to cohabit with the other policy head in Nick Clegg's team, a very clever woman called Pauline McKenzie, who runs Demos. And it was obvious to all of us that this was this this sort of thing was going to last no time at all, that they were sort of going to fall in policy love. <laughs> and of course, it, it didn't last very much longer than a year or so. But 
the thing that really kept that coalition going, which it did for five years, a cement, if you, if you like, was trying to put the country on the right track again. Um, and in the end, yes, the Lib Dems lost a lot of votes at the, the next election. I'm sure they feel more regretful about their time in government. I mean, I, I always say to Lib Dem friends of mine, I think that I think you should be proud of the fact that you were a party that, that went into government. Being in government means you have to live with the legacy of a decision, and that is very uncomfortable for people who haven't done it. Um, but I, for one, am proud of having been in number 10 in a coalition. It's a very interesting observation, uh, Anthony. But, no, I, nothing further to add. But I would just say, I, I, that's so clever, <laughs> about the Deputy Prime Minister and, and the Office of Prime Minister being made up, that, that I think the best insight into the way number 10 works is Kate's, um, Paul's book, The Gatekeeper. If you really want to know what it is like uh, in Downing Street, she, she observes, she just observes so clearly. That's why... I, she was such a great source for the books I wrote. She just observed so closely what was happening, was so patient when she saw them uh, making mistakes and then just helped them um, uh, think clearly. Get it? it, it uh, there are two books on talked about tonight. This one is infinitely the better. <laughs> <laughs> That's very humble of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. Uh, now I want to open up this discussion to the floor. If any members want to ask a question, please put your hand up, and then one of our committee members will go to you with the microphone. The member there. Hi. Um, <clears throat> thank you to all three of you. Uh, I had a question for the two practitioners. We've spoken a lot about the office of the prime minister and the prime minister themselves. But I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what makes a good advisor to a prime minister and what in particular sort of defines that. So I think, I think that's a key part of it. I mean, judgment, political judgment is, is a slightly difficult thing to sort of pinpoint. But in a way, having the, um, the room to use political judgment, I think is something you can help create. And one of my my jobs, I was, you know, a senior advisor to the Prime Minister, and I also had a role as gatekeeper, hence the name of the book. And I mean that the, the importance of that is that you are prioritizing the Prime Minister's time, but you're also choosing the people who are in the room who are going to make the decision. And back to a point I made earlier, it really is more important than people realize because if you if you have if if there is that level of trust. You, you do feel you can tell the Prime Minister when you think they're doing something wrong. Um, or you could just, it's, it's, they're difficult issues. These issues are issues where there's no perfect way. There's, there's going to be a cost, sometimes, you know, cost in terms of people's lives, if you want, to all these sides of the house. That's really tough. It's not perfect. And you really got to be able to argue them through and trust each other to do that. So to me, I felt that my time at um, the six years I was in number 10 and the five years before, I hope that I gave good advice as, as an advisor, just as a person who had the ear of the Prime Minister. But I feel if I was being honest about also what I gave that was different to other people, I hope that I created an atmosphere for good decision making that meant people weren't afraid to say what they thought and took the time to say it. Thank you. Uh, I can take another question. Uh, question there. I suppose this is one more directed for Anthony Selden, but um, and I'll keep it short. But you, when you talked about sort of what you thought a good premiership was, I think you seem to sort of correlate that with radical change or, or at least historical change. And do you think there's sort of are any occasions where actually continuity can also constitute being a good prime minister as well as change? Well. And you said be short, and I, I am short. And even when I'm standing up, I'm still uh, the same height as Ollie sitting uh, <laughs> down. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, look, uh, there is Salisbury uh, over there, over there, and was Prime Minister 1886 to uh, 1902, and didn't change a whole lot of things. So there is clearly a time for change. Attlee, we mentioned in 1945, Thatcher in 1979, the country was ripe for change at that time. You can still be a very considerable prime minister and not introduce change, and you can be a foolish prime minister when the country doesn't need change and introduce much more change than is, than is needed. 
but I think to be one of those truly great historic leaders, same is true of French presidents and, and, and Chinese premiers, um, to, 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 to be truly historic, you need to oversee major change. And another, here's another thing about those great historic prime ministers, they were all there at times of, of great shock. So um, a Warpole um, uh, w uh, at the time of the South Sea bubble, which was profoundly disturbing, Pitt the Younger with the Napoleonic and Revolutionary Wars and so on, Lloyd George, First World War Churchill, obviously Thatcher at the, at the breakup of the uh, Soviet Union and a time of huge economic turbulence. So it helps to be um, it helps to be historic for any leader to be there at a time of very significant change, but not all times require major change. But, yeah. Thank you, Anthony. Um, well, as a recent PPU graduate who've done both British political paper that Oxford has to offer, I wish we could be here all night discussing this topic, but I'm afraid we are running out of time. So I just want to squeeze in one final question to all three of you. And I put it on the record, this is not my question, I'm asking for a friend. On um, becoming prime minister, do you think, does it take more ego, more confidence, more charisma, or more intelligence to reach the role and stay in it? I'm sure many people in government are asking the same question. I think I'm sort of tending towards resilience. I mean, charisma might get you the job, but it's not going to keep you in it. Um, so if you're a two-term prime minister, um, and, and, and also the, the resilience there to actually do the job, the long hours, make the decision, have the clear head to make decisions. So I'll, be, I'll, I'll go in with Ollie. It's a bloody job, you know. Why would anybody... I mean, you know, you're going to go off and you're going to do amazing jobs in your life and you very rightly would ask, so what's happened to the people who've done this job before me. And if you went in for a job and you found out that everybody since the end of the Second World War, which by the way, is a very long time away, every single person was shoved out of the office and they were all in tears, uh, either publicly or behind uh, closed doors. You would think, what on earth? And if you also told that everyone's trying to shoot you and, 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 and people, hate you, um, and they're just people in your cabinet, um, uh, you, you would think, why, why would you do this? So absolutely resilience uh, is, is there, and that ability to have this strength, the intellectual confidence to take divergent points of view. Weak people, whatever you do in life, weak people will surround themselves with people like them and strong uh, leaders. But also you know, uh, a point that Kate mentioned about that having that charisma and cuts were necessary to get you there. But also, you know, look, I love Keir Starmer. Well, I literally love Keir Starmer, but I think he's really good, but he doesn't have cut through. He doesn't have that giant, larger than life uh, quality that you need uh, to, to, to power you through. In other words, it needs an impossible range of, uh, 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 of qualities, which is why it's an impossible office. Hey, to coin a phrase that you mentioned earlier, that was a good phrase, yeah. <laughs> you say Anthony Murray subtly being on brand with his book. And I'm glad the panel reached this consensus resilience, one of the quality to stay in the impossible office. And with that, please all join me to thank our distinguished speaker who came to spend time with us tonight. Thank you. <laughs>